we've really enjoyed talking to Steve for, for a bit about how interesting NASA is and how innovative in innovation itself. And Steve, I, I apologize. I kind of made a, a joke at your expense a little bit earlier when I introduced this to Mozilla and said that, you know, NASA, although they do from time to time still rely on the English measurement system, they are still uh, innovating in innovation with all the challenges and the interesting work that you're doing uh, in that area. Um, we've super appreciated talking with Steve just earlier. It's really interesting hearing your thoughts on the changing nature of work, uh, working with collaboration outside one's border. So I think we'll all really appreciate hearing your engineering expertise and, and insight from this. I think there's a lot um, that's somewhat similar between Mozilla and NASA in the sense that we're two very driven, uh, engineering driven organizations, very mission driven as well. So thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate it. And he does say uh, there are stickers for anybody in the San Francisco office. Um, get out of your offices and come on down here. So yeah, thanks Steve. Great. Stick those wherever you want. Well, thank you. Uh, this is a real honor to be here. I. I have uh, followed Mozilla for years, and uh, you guys are really, you know, are, are where cu curated communities started. And so I, I am kind of thrilled to be here and, and uh, looking forward to sharing kind of our journey and, and some of the things that we've learned through our work in, with crowds. Um, I guess first off, it's best to, to talk about who we are. Um, there were a couple managers at NASA uh, that were experimenting with uh, this back in 2009, 2010, uh, once their, their budgets got cut and they really needed to find some new ways, they found crowdsourcing as this thing that was out there. And so they actually started benchmarking with PNG and other companies and running some pilot programs. And about uh, 2010, uh, the Office, Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House came and said, you know, we really want the whole federal government to be using these new methods to get things done. You guys seem to have a head start, so would you stand up a center of excellence around that? And so that's what we have. We have a center of excellence, um, and, and we are chartered to actually go help other federal agencies understand these tools and help them get going with it. And so our job is to educate folks about what this is and to really bring that home for them, and then also to reduce the barriers. Uh, we see ourselves as kind of Sherpas, to, to, to steal Steve Domick's uh, from GE's term. Uh, we help people that have not used these tools to use them. So we have the contracts in place. We actually help them every step of the way uh, to do challenges. So we do that across all NASA centers, and we have 10 different centers, uh, and we do that across all federal agencies. Um, we also have our public spacing side, which is our NASA tournament lab, which I'm going to dig into a little bit here. Now, before I get into the NASA tournament lab, I will say we are not the only crowdsourcing emphasis at NASA. There are others, and you can see them here. Centennial Challenges is our large kind of X prize level, you know, multi-year, multi-million dollar prize uh, competitions. Uh, we also have several others that are education-based or the, our big hackathon, the Space Apps Challenge, uh, Future Engineers. These are all efforts that, that are similar. The thing that ours, uh, our effort to the NASA Tournament Lab is that we focus on these commercial curated crowds. And that toolkit looks something like this. Um, and you're going <laughs> to, this is Logo Fest, okay? So I'll just apologize now. I represent everything in logos. And there's a disclaimer at the bottom that says we don't endorse anybody. So. There's that. We're the government. Woo um, so you can kind of see we have uh, various contracts in place with different crowds. And you can see on the right-hand side, this is our NASA Open Innovation Services contract, which I'll talk more about. And that deals a lot with our innovation problem solvings and algorithms and software. But then we also have our internal crowd, NASA at work. We have a global search network uh, for technology yet too. And then we actually have been doing some work uh, in our micro challenges, our micro purchase challenges for $3,500 or less. And then we also have a partnership with uh, Harvard uh, Business School in, in kind of trying to understand how this stuff works and to optimize it. Um, let me just start with NASA at work um, because <laughs> NASA has some of the most innovative people in the world, right? And so it seems like the natural place to start is there, especially if you're talking to them, they're the most innovative people in the world. Uh, don't tell them otherwise. Um, and so NASA at work is this internal crowd. So NASA uh, is about 17,000 civil servants. And uh, if you add in all of our contractor base, about 60,000. Um, and so NASA at work, we have about half of our civil servants on this and about a third of our contractors. So we have about 20,000 people on this platform. 
they are the challenges we run on here are free to any project so they don't have to have any cost they just have to be willing to support it and we really find that this platform is best for what we call enterprise knowledge sharing i don't know about you guys but we have lots of silos where folks are have deadlines, budgets, their heads down, trying to get that work done. They don't have time to go present that at, at conferences. They don't have time to go share that with other people. They don't have to time, time to go look at other people's work. And so this is our human network that basically people say, look, I, I'm trying to do this. Um, is there anybody else that knows, knows a better solution or a solution to this or work that's going on? And this network finds that and they get an email and they look at it, and most of the time they, they go, I have no idea about any of these challenges, and they close it and delete it. it, took them 30 seconds. But every once in a while, they'll get an email that says, hey, there's a thermodynamic problem we're having here, and they go, well, I work thermodynamics, what are they doing? And they'll click down, and they'll see that, and then they'll say, oh, you should be talking to Jim, because they have actually got this working over here with some thermoelectric coupling or whatever. Um, and so it's really good. And in fact, when we do public challenges, we often have to filter out the chaff because you get a lot of people that just want to be in on a NASA, NASA challenge. But in our workforce, we find that we, we have very little filtering required because almost everyone that responds actually knows something. Uh, and so we only get about 20 to 40 responses per challenge, but they're almost always right on target. So that's our NASA work. I will tell you our incentives for this are things like cool NASA experiences. So we actually let people drive a rover or get in the VR lab or, you know, things that people know we have uh, and are able to experience. Um, and sometimes it'll be things like uh, management. We actually ran a challenge on the platform to ask people what would incentivize you and then uh, voted those into the top set. And that's been really helpful in, in trying to to find incentives that, that work with people. I'm going to talk incentives a little bit later, but um, I will tell you by and large, NASA people believe they're innovative and they want to make a difference. And here's the thing, no matter who you are and how cool the project you're working on, when you're working on a, with a team of anywhere from five to 25 people, after a while you feel like you're just another cog, right? and people really yearn to be the difference maker. And, and challenges tend to be the way people can differentiate themselves and show that they're an individual contributor, which is, is this kind of base need. I find it fascinating. I'll, I'll talk to people that are actually working on rocket propulsion and have been for five years and be like, I'm so bored of my job. It's just, you know, one of those things. Our NASA Open Innovation Services contract, or our NOISE contract, we're very clever that way, um, that's 10 of some of the, the lead crowdsourcing vendors in the world. So when we talk about this, this is, you know, Kaggle is almost a million data scientists, machine learning experts. Some of the best machine learning data science in the world is going on on Kaggle. Uh, Popcoder, 1.2 million software developers. Uh, we're talking Nine Sigma, 2 million innovators, uh, in a sense of about 400,000 people who are passionate about problem solving and very diverse. So very different crowds. Uh, we even have Tongle, which is filmmakers, you know, 100,000, 200,000 filmmakers, and, and uh, that's their passion. And the way we work these is we have them all on contract, and when we get a challenge idea, we put it out to them as a little RFP, and we say, who can give us a, a good plan for how you do a challenge here? And they come back with their proposals, and we award to that. But it gives us access to literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people with different expertise and different passions, uh, all with different models uh, where we can actually get access to those, to those uh, great ideas. Yet two is our contract uh, that, that does network technology search. So they can actually search the globe for technologies we need, which if you're starting out a, a sensor project or some technology, you really need to know what's coming. Because if you don't, you're going to spend $2 million going down a path using some archaic version or what's out there now, and, and you can find out there on a search engine. Uh, and then two years down the road, something comes out that, that can actually perform it twice, twice of what you can do. Well, now you've got to go to the program manager and say, well, we can throw away this $2 million we just spent and, and keep what we have. Or we can actually pay the price by sticking with what we have uh, and, and having the poor performance. Anyway, that's our yet to. And then our final is our, our 
micro challenges. So these are, are $3,500 or less. Government purchase cards don't require a contract. So we can actually purchase things uh, without going through the nine month process of, of putting out for bid and the rest. And that's been really handy because we, we've been actually experimenting with freelancer, uh, with GrabCAD, C outsource. And then we've actually found that Top Coder and HeroX and Mechanical Turk can all do these things too. And what we're finding is with the NASA brand, and with some simple challenges out there, we can actually get some pretty amazing stuff for not a whole lot of money. So, for instance, we got design, UI designs for a smartwatch uh, app for the crew that had crew timeline, caution and warning, uh, comm status, all for uh, about $1,500 for a UI concept, and then turned around and did that as a freelancer task for $3,000. So for $4,500, got a working prototype with a simulated data feed for almost nothing. Um, and that's really valuable sometimes when we're trying to do rapid prototyping and rapid work. And it engages the public in a way where a lot of people send us email to say, look, I'm, I'm glad you put this out there because you basically made my dream come true to work for NASA. So they actually are wanting to contribute uh, and, and be part of the solution. Um, we've been doing more and more with this for me as kind of a broker at NASA with where we actually try to, to engage the workforce. This is a really inexpensive entry point to introduce the idea of crowdsourcing because a lot of people don't understand how it works. They don't want to spend a lot of money. And so that we'll do a logo challenge or something and really show how the innovation and creativity can, can come through these projects. Let me just go through a few of the things that we've seen. We've seen significant cost savings uh, in our tool set, and we do present this as a tool set. So Robonaut Vision Algorithm, we actually did that as a $60,000 challenge on Top Coder, and we're able to get a, a really effective algorithm that if we had used our standard weight, which would have been at like a, an SBIR, Small Business Initiative, uh, it, which would have gone to one group to develop over 18 months and would have cost us almost a million dollars, we actually got a, a huge savings off of this and engaged the, the rest of the world on developing that vision algorithm. Astronaut email, um, this is with disruption tolerant networking. This is a kind of complex protocol we use uh, in our delay to, uh, delayed network. So the farther you get from Earth, the more time delay from light time uh, affects us. And so we actually did a, uh, we've done a whole suite of these, uh, but you can see for, for this, we actually developed the entire solution uh, Quite a bit cheaper than we could have done normally. And then internal, uh, these free challenges we do. Uh, this is one where we actually had a group that was trying to uh, measure urine volume and microgravity. There's a lot of bodily fluid stuff we do in space. It's really kind of gross. Um, I could talk about the space poop challenge later. But anyway, um, for this one, we, we had this group that, that needed this new capability, this, this really small capability. Uh, a, a small mass and volume. And they were about to go spend uh, really one to two million dollars on a, a procurement to try to find a solution. And they happened to do a NASA at work challenge and say, hey, does anyone else have ideas on this? And there happened to be, no kidding, 300 yards away in another building, another group that had developed a, a prototype that was already capable of doing this for another purpose. Uh, and it ended up saving them, you know, what, $1.3 million in three to five years because it already existed. And, and so if you've already got it, why go uh, invent it again? We, we see quite a bit of uh, increased performance. So Asteroid Data Hunters, this is another one we did on Top Coder where we actually improved the ability to take images uh, that we get from telescopes, which have to be in series, you kind of get a, a little movie, and you actually have to find these very dark objects that are really hard uh, to find because they're spinning and the reflection's not all the same. And so we are actually able to get an algorithm that, that, that processes those images and gets us 15% improvement. But for under 200K, we not only got the algorithm, we also got an open source uh, downloadable uh, multi-platform app that, that, that amateur astronomers could use so that we can get the multiplication of lots of amateur astronomers actually using the tool to find asteroids, which then uh, goes to our purpose, which is we want to save you guys from, you know, the end of the world. So <laughs> the lunar mapping model this is an interesting one where uh, it wasn't actually uh, the, the lunar uh, 
uh, LRO, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, imagery, had all this high-def imagery we were stitching together. Uh, it was taking us like 18 hours to do a single run. They re-architected the code so that it was multi-node, reduced that to, to three hours. Um, so a 3x improvement, really nice stuff. Data-driven forecasting, this is an interesting one. Um, we actually put this out, and uh, so we, we have to be able to pr predict solar flares, right, to protect the crew on space station especially, but also uh, in the future for, for Earth and, and for deep space missions. So we put that out there. We have a capability to currently, uh, before this challenge, we had a two-hour prediction capability. So two hours before a solar flare, we could see, hey, something's bubbling, get in shelter. Um, and we put this out there to see if we could get that to maybe four hours. Um, the winning algorithm we got back through in incentive actually gave us an eight hour capability. So twice of what our target was and four X what we, we had originally. And the guy who did this was a retired cell phone engineer, okay? Who had all sorts of experience in signal processing math, but he happened to also have an undergraduate degree from 50 years before in heliophysics. And it happened to be that the solution that gave us this great prediction used the math from signal processing applied to heliophysics. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit later about how you don't know what you don't know, but in a given discipline, you just don't have visibility into things that are going on in other disciplines that can be applied to yours. And, and so you, we have these blind spots that crowdsourcing really exposes. Um, if I go on to solving previously unsolved problems, um, this is where the crowd really excels because you start to get these adjacent uh, expertise, these adjacent domains that can, can bring in knowledge that you need. So Mars balance, I don't know if you know this, but when we go take uh, the sky crane to Mars and we lower the Curiosity rover down, uh, one of the things that we do is as you're coming through the atmosphere, you can't use your propulsion system because aero forces are starting to affect you. You can't use aero surfaces because there's not enough air to make aero surfaces work. So what they do is they use balloon technology, right? So back from the 1900s, and they basically throw off uh, ballast. And by doing that, that changes the, the trajectory and the attitude of the vehicle. Um, it's very expensive to take mass all the way to Mars, right? Everybody knows this, right? Even a tiny little bit costs a ton. And so there was always this feeling that if we're gonna throw off solid tungsten just in case we need it, maybe there's some science we could get from that. And so that's, this challenge was trying to figure out, is there some way we could overload that mass to something that could give a scientific return? Ended up, the guy who solved this was small, from a small town in Texas, I think like population 600, something like that. Marine biology was his expertise. And for some reason, he came up with this idea that we could actually use barium or trace elements to eject out and then use orbiting vehicles to actually watch it with multispectral imaging as those elements dissolve in the atmosphere and tell us all sorts of things about the, the upper atmosphere of Mars. Brilliant, right? This guy's actually gone on to win like 14 other incentive challenges. He's this kind of super solver is what I call him. Um, but the, he's actually gone and briefed the, the, the Mars team and they're looking at how they can incorporate that into future missions. Uh, strain measurement Kevlar. Sometimes it's not the space stuff, it's the test rigs on the ground. And what was interesting here is that the, the folks that were doing this, once we got the answers back and there were three different solutions that would work that they had not any insight into before, they actually said, you know, these solutions are so simple, so elegant, how could we have not known about them? Which is really the mantra of innovation is people are, are how did I not know that? It was staring me in the face. Um, and then the last one, this is actually a pretty big deal. We have a uh, disruption tolerant networking, which when you get to the security of something like that, if you think about the way security key exchanges work, it's all very synchronous, right? You have to have very tight timing to make those, those key distributions work. We had no way to do, to do that. You, you have nodes all over the solar system. How do you do that? And uh, we put that challenge out. We had actually gone to some agencies who had said, yeah, that's not possible. Here's a mathematical proof of why that's not possible. And if you ever find out that it's possible, please let us know because it's a big deal. Um, and 
after about a year at about $100,000, we were able to actually find that the solution was actually uh, something that we were using to synchronize multiple computers uh, voting scheme using a, an approach that solves the Byzantine General's network problem. And now we've actually implemented something and have something working where previously we didn't even know if something existed. And the last one I won't spend a lot of time on, this is our, our finding the right emerging technology. Uh, measuring intracranial pressure totally changed the direction of that project. They were headed down one way, did a search, found all sorts of stuff that was going on in the, in the rest of the world, changed the direction of that project. Uh, within the first two weeks of this aero fast computing and engine control search, they said, hey, we, we've already saved $200,000. Uh, and then uh, on the monitoring water and biocides, um, again, this research group that's been working along and for them to actually find eight different technology leads that were significant that they previously knew nothing about, that's, that's a big deal. Um, and I will say, we live in a world right now where technology is bubbling on multiple fronts, right? Nanotechnology, bio, uh, all sorts of places that, that you can't keep track of. 30, 40 years ago, if you were looking for the latest technology in your area, you would have a tech journal and a, a gray hair that was, would help you find what's, what's going on in the world. You can't do that today. And so you really have to have these kind of networks you can tap into that find all of the applicable stuff uh, going on around the multiple disciplines. So we've done, a, coming up on 300, this is a little outdated. Um, but we've done a number of challenges over the last few years. You can see they're in various areas from technical solutions, software algorithms, tech surveys. Uh, you can see almost half of them are internal. Um, and I'll just point to the bottom. The bulk of our, of our challenges are successful. They have value add. Um, I think something like 95% show to cost savings. The average cost savings tends to be about 60%, which is not insignificant. Um, almost all of them have some level of progress with over half being all outright solved. So we feel really good about what we've got going. Uh, we're building momentum. It is change though, and getting engineers to use these new methods, I will tell you, continues to be something that, that we work on because it's not, it's not throughout the entire uh, uh, agency. So this is just a little bit of what we've learned through our journey. Uh, and, and again, some of this you may resonate with because you guys have been doing this for a lot longer. Um, I think one, I'll just go through a few execution lessons learned. Um, one of the things that's, that's huge for us is if you have a challenge, the challenge owner has to own the problem. In other words, never run a challenge because your IT department has a problem because you'll run that challenge, get an answer, go back to your IT guys and say, hey, here's the answer to this problem that we didn't talk to you about. And they'll say, well, you forgot we have all these other constraints. They'll, sometimes they'll just make an excuse, but you have to get the buy-in from the folks that actually own the problem. And in fact, those people need to be the owners. Uh, and sometimes that's not as simple as one group. A lot of times our challenges uh, are actually owned by multiple groups. So the operations folks or the IT guys or the systems engineering, all of those folks may actually be party to that problem and you have to pull them in if you, if you hope to actually implement the solution. Um, a lot of time we have to be careful rushing into challenges. Um, it's, it's so easy to get excited about this stuff and just put a, want to put a challenge out there, but really getting well-defined goals, well-defined requirements, and the right challenge statement. Um, there's a great example uh, back on NSF where they had like Frito-Lay come in with this potato chip problem. They wanted to get grease off of potato chips, right? And um, they actually, uh, the first thing that NSF did is they reworded the challenge. Not how to get grease off of the potato chips, but how do you get a viscous fluid off of a delicate wafer? Now, that sounds simple, right? That statement, instead of targeting just food scientists, now opened up the challenge to almost anyone, right? It could be somebody working silicon wafers. It could be someone working biology. The actual winner of that challenge, who the winning solution actually was to vibrate the air around the, the chips at the natural frequency of the oil, right? And the oil just flies off. The person that did that was a, a violinist. 
And I will tell you, food processing people are all mechanical engineers who, who that's what they do. They, they understand frequency, natural frequency, right? I'm a mechanical engineer. I know. I had lots of classes on that. And yet, food scientists have been looking at that problem for probably 50 to 100 years, and not one of those mechanical engineers came up with that solution. But uh, sorry. So in the adjacent space of a violin player, they're actually somebody who has an a, a expertise that's right next door and can break through that that shell that we built. Um, complete data sets. If you're doing analog, uh, uh, any sort of algorithms, then you really have to have some great data sets. Clear evaluation criteria. What are we actually going to judge this against? And having a clear picture of that. Uh, Again, all the stakeholders, and then in incentives. Um, a lot of people think you can just throw a bunch of money at this stuff or that cachet will do it. Different people have different opinions, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about incentives later. But there's actually research we have done out of Harvard that says if you put too large of a bounty on something, it can drive people away, which is counterintuitive, right? Um, sometimes people are working on these not for the money, but for some other reason. So if you give them a kind of buffet of, of rewards, you have a better chance of getting something you want. And then judgment day, uh, being ready to actually figure out how do you select? We had the space poop challenge, which had 20,000 registrants and 5,000 submissions. And one of the things that we uh, very early did was we put together a judging panel um, I'll come back to watching biases, but we actually had the vendor, Hero X in this case, on contract to only pass to us those submissions that met our requirements. So they had to go filter all of those submission, 5,000 submissions down to 87 that actually met our requirements. Trust me, you don't want to look at that many space poop entries because you cannot unsee space poop submissions from the public. I can talk about that later. Um, watching for bias, um, if innovation is new, and especially if you have expertise within a company, you'd be surprised at how much uh, folks can actually say, oh, that's a bad idea <laughs> when it competes with their idea. Um, ownership of, of solutions uh, is a real problem, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. And then just being prepared for multiple winners, the idea that you actually might get uh, more than one winner uh, to, to, that, that's value add. So let me head into key learnings. Um, the first is innovation is dangerous. Um, I, I've come to believe this, <laughs> um, both organizationally uh, for a couple of reasons. One, innovations actually can cause disruption. And in a company, if you're not willing to have disruption, don't go ask for it. Right? Um, the other thing is in a workforce, everyone wants to be innovated. But we, we have, we have uh, a saying at, at NASA, uh, the innovation eye roll is what I call it. When somebody talks about innovation, everyone goes, oh, yeah, we've been talking about this. We are innovative. But every time we want to do something innovative, you cut the legs out from under us. And so as, as an organization, if you're going to go down this, hey, we want to be innovative, just know the workforce, right, is, is watching and listening. Is this real? Or are you going to do the Linus uh, or the, the Charlie Brown pull in the football? Because they've been down this road before. And they have innovative ideas. It's just no one will listen to them. So we get this over and over, and we've actually seen some real uh, things that, that can make uh, organizations crash and burn on this, and other things that really uh, make, make organizations uh, hum. Um, along with that, today's innovation success is tomorrow's barrier. Um, if you've got somebody who came up with this really innovative code or this really innovative feature or design, in five years, when it's time to actually make that do something better, that person is actually probably going to be the person that is not, is standing in your way because that was their success. And so you've got to find a way. Um, and what we say is own the problem, don't own your solutions. And in fact, this is something we've really been trying to get our folks head around <laughs> is if you own the problem space, then yes, your solution is one thing in that. 
But it's not the only thing. And in fact, if you're being judged on how well you're solving a problem, not on how good your solution is. I know that's subtle, right? But if you're judged on how well you're advancing solutions to a problem and you own the problem, then you're open to all comers, right? Any tool I can get my hands on that makes that problem, uh, that solution uh, win, right? And then I, I said this before, you don't know what you don't know, which I recently saw was a Socrates quote, which I realized that I was quoting Socrates. Um, and what's interesting about this is, is what, what happens is we build this shell, right? We, we think we've analyzed all of the, uh, the pieces, but we just don't know. So there's a great example out of uh, Roche Diagnostics, global uh, multinational uh, pharmaceutical company, $8 billion in R&D a year. And they were dipping their toe in incentive. And one of the things they found was uh, that they, they looked across their company for what are the top 10 unsolved problems. So I had this one where they needed to have a very precise uh, quantity and quality measurement going into this diagnostic machine. And they had worked for 15 years to come up with a solution. Brought in all sorts of outside people, 15 years proprietary research. They did a six week challenge for $20,000 prize on an incentive, came back that the winner actually came from two different people. So it existed out there. But when they looked across everything in the submissions, they found everything that they had tried over 15 years of proprietary research replicated in a six week challenge. If you think about it, our R&D model is to put five biochemists in a biochemistry lab and hope that they come up with the next big biochemistry thing. But what this says is the answer lives outside of that. In fact, uh, there was some research that MIT did that said that of these successful solutions, 70 plus percent came from people outside of the domain so if, uh, of the challenge owner. So if you have a biochemistry problem, only 30% of the time is the solver gonna come from biochemistry. It's, it's because we have a shell around that domain. We don't know what we don't know, but crowds might. And this is really trying to explain that, right? Because those people in the crowd, when they have that complementary expertise is the key piece um, and sometimes it's actual experience or it's domain. It's that magic of the person that's got the right intersection of all the things in their life that help them to contribute to what you've got going on. And a lot of times I get the question, who's in the crowd? And a lot of people think it's teenagers in the basement and people that have been laid off. And it is absolutely not. There are, there are people, what I like to say is everyone's in the crowd. Now that doesn't mean everyone's in the crowd. What it means is a bit of everyone is in the crowd and it's growing all the time. So you get people all over and sometimes they're existing community members and sometimes they come in as part of the challenge. Um, another way I like to look at this in terms of expertise and why, why do we go outside, right? Why does NASA need to go outside to find somebody uh, to, to help with their problem? And I like to explain it this way, right? For, this is a generalized graph, right? Where along the bottom is, is capability or expertise. So out here on the, the far right are your world experts and back there are your dumb as dirt people, right? And then you got people and any sort of expertise, you've got this curve where, yeah, some people understand that do discipline or that, that uh, domain. But if you're in an organization like we are and probably like you guys are, then you really see that you're a right shifted blip, right? And in fact, you probably have some of those world experts. The reality is though, your blip really looks like this. It's still right shifted, but you're so much smaller than you think. <laughs> this world has seven and a half billion people and a good chunk of them are online now and a bigger chunk than you think are educated. Um, and so the, the value proposition is that you can reach a portion of these folks that are in that green wedge to the right. And those are the people that are smarter than the people you've got by and large. And guess what? All your smart people are busy. <laughs> so it's not like you can use them. Uh, and so contests tend to be the way that you can extract and draw out these people and access that expertise. Um, I'll give an example. I was talking to a Rice student um, who said, yeah, I, I participate on Kaggle challenges doing data, data algorithms, but uh, I was a a face at Facebook on an internship last year and my cube was right next to all the data scientists at Facebook, right? And Facebook's a little bit of the Super Bowl of data science, right? And he said, those guys, 
Their lunch breaks at night and on the weekends were all working Kaggle problems. Not because they needed the money, not because they wanted the prize. It was, they just liked hard problems. That's why they did what they did. You can get that expertise in ways that you don't expect. And in fact, when I looked across, uh, one day I did a snapshot and just looked across what other uh, companies were doing. IBM, Facebook, Draper Labs, all were running challenges, even though they all have some of the best data science groups around. Almost done. <laughs> just don't forget, people wanna make a difference in your company and outside. This is what we found, is people fundamentally wanna make a difference and that is a huge incentive. <laughs> Crowds are best engaged and not used. Uh, you guys know this, right? I mean, your curation of crowds, as soon as people tune in that you're trying to use them without getting something in return, a lot of times you, you think, oh, they'll just do this for free because you know, we're NASA and, and they'll do that for free for us. Um, you suddenly run the risk of alienating that crowd, right? And so the, a lot of these commercial companies have really gotten that balance down to where they're actually incentivizing in a way that draws the best people and compensates them in a way that they want to be compensated. Now I'll say, I got I think of one more chart on incentives. That's not always money. But crowds can be useful uh, as any other tool. We want this to just be another way to get an answer, right? Maybe that was MATLAB for you at one point. Maybe that was a subcontractor, some contractor at one point. Maybe it was open source crowds at one point. And all of those are still valid and in the tool set probably should be open innovation. The big thing, hard problems require hard work. If you really want to take on the big challenges of getting to that really big answer that changes the way things work, then it requires decomposing that problem, understanding it, uh, and really spend some, spending some time on it. People think they can just throw a challenge out and because it, it's big to them that it'll actually be out there. You really have to narrow things down right now. Uh, if you're gonna put a, a technical challenge out there uh, that doesn't have teaming, we can get into some of that um, because it's individuals right now for the most part and individuals have a limited scope. Um, last little bit here, crowd incentives. It's not all about the money. If you think crowdsourcing is all about the money, then we, we're just not finding that to be the case. There's a whole lot of people are doing this because it's their community now, or they just want to, to socialize with others. A lot of them love that prestige and that, that uh, getting recognized. Um, for us, we actually leverage the do good, the altruism. People feel when they contribute to a NASA project that they are somehow uh, helping NASA achieve its mission, which they believe in. Uh, and then there's there's just experience. A lot of people get on a top coder to actually up their game. And I, I, I think you're probably familiar, top coder, a top coder score you can take into a Facebook and get a job. Like if your score is high enough, you've proven what you can do and people are using that as a currency. Um, and so sometimes we actually use multiple parallel uh, incentives rather than all one. Uh, the shortcut for this is gold, guts, glory, and, and good. Okay, last chart, and this is just to, to kind of sum up. Um, for us, the, this is a proven tool set. We've seen the good that comes out of these, uh, and it's making a difference. It, it's not like we have to cherry pick results. Almost every one of our challenges has some positive that comes out of it. Um, infusion of these techniques is really hard, and it's a culture change, and we continue to, to, to slog through that culture change. Um, and then this last thing, uh, we're getting to where technology needs uh, or technology is really enabling us to, to match up what our technical needs are with the solution providers in a way that we haven't been able to do before. Um, getting that right expert at the right time just for the time period that you need so that it enhances your project, right? That's what you need. Uh, and that's what we're finding is really useful. And with that, Open it for questions. 40, I did 40. Great, thank you. So reminder, if you are in an office like San Francisco or Mountain View or Vancouver, wherever you are located, 
you can ask a question directly with the microphone. You can also submit them on Slack at speaker dash series or in Air Mozilla on IRC. So we already have a few. And I'm going to start. There was actually some conversation in the Slack about um, the community and the community that is involved. So I will start with this question, which is how many of the proposed solutions are from people who have already have solutions at hand and how many are from people that are just doing the work on spec? The concern here is that it's just another variation of the gig economy in a world where paying work gets more and more precarious. Right. Um, I will say it depends. Um, in an asset work type of challenge, a lot of that work we're actually asking for people to, to give us stuff they've already done. But that's all owned by NASA. So I think that question is probably more about the public. Um, what we find is a lot of times technical solutions come from things that exist, and so they're pointing us to something. They may or may not own that. Um, but but yeah, it's a, it's a mix. Some, I don't know if it's on spec very often, uh, because oftentimes what we're asking for is not something that they would typically build, because otherwise we'd probably just build it. Um, so it, it depends on the challenge is probably the best solution there, or the best answer. Um, but we do recognize some of the tension that's going on in the in the gig economy, and some of the 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 pricing. Right, uh, a lot of that is due to the disparity in the global uh, rewards mark, like like how much uh, somebody's willing to do, and that we think is starting to 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 actually even out over the next ten years, probably. Okay, uh, I see one in the room in San Francisco. Oh no, thank you, Susie. I'm gonna throw this down and watch this. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, so I have a question about, you say, okay, access to uh, like a large population. Um, how could you flip that around and also um, make the those people part of the question process? Because having a good question, yeah. as you mentioned at the end, is also very worthwhile. Yeah, and we actually do that sometimes. Um, I will say when we use TopCoder, for instance, uh, you, we, we oftentimes don't send them specs for coding. What we'll, what they'll do is they'll break it out into a bunch of little challenges. So the very first one would be a conceptualization challenge where they're taking the bigger problem and, and talking about what are the possible directions. And that's where you get innovation kind of at each level. You don't just hand them spec work to go do, but rather, hey, let's let's see how much innovation we can infuse into that. Um, like I say, on the internal platform, we did that with our with our rewards. We actually opened it up to them to to bring that in. I think that gets into, you know, how do you ask smart questions and how do you use your challenge platforms? Really, uh, we do that a lot in series. We'll do an ideation up front and then we'll do an algorithm challenge or something on the back end. So that's very much what we we try to do. Thanks. There's a joke about nerds playing ball here, but <laughs> I'm one of you, so I'm not going to tell. It's not them. us. Um, earning the problem, not the solution. So this is a, a, a quite a strong statement, and it's. I would be interesting how you you are able, or if you are able to implement it, and what things you are using to incentivize people to stay unsuccessful. Yeah, it's it's tough. It's we're, we're we're trying to alert people to the bias, right? Um, and that is the protectionism of their own solution, um, because what what a lot of people come and say, hey, I want a grant to improve my solution a little bit, but if they own the problem, then they're they actually see that the gap is much bigger than an incremental improvement. It it needs to be fundamentally large, and that doesn't say that you still can't have your own solution. It just means take all comers, right? And and we're having mixed results on on that. That's a hard message for some people to hear. You know, when you invest a lot in a solution, um, it's easy to forget that you probably need to own the problem, or somebody above you needs to own that problem, uh, and that that's that's how you're going to get the bigger wins. And at the end of the day, we're not. We're really judged on how well are you solving the problem? 
how much progress have you made on the big problem? Uh, not is your solution getting incrementally better, right? And, and those, they're very closely related, but they're not the same thing. Um, and so you can measure a solution against how well it's, it's, it's answering the bigger problem, but uh, the barrier is holding on too tightly, right? Hopefully that answered that. Ah, uh, see, that was a soccer. Yes. That, that's that's okay. soccer right there. Did you do you want to ask one? Too? Did you have one? Sure. Yeah. I didn't know if you could talk a little bit more. I know you said said several times it's just, it just takes time to change management to get this to be brought on board as an actual tool. Is there anything more that you could give to us as some suggestions? Or yeah. So what's been really effective for us is to make sure we have dedicated resources to um, to really take on the the Sherpa role, right? This this idea of getting the barriers down as low as possible and really recognizing that people have real work. Um, so part of that is middle management in particular is in tune with what the real message is. Doesn't matter what you say, but what are they being judged against? So if you're being judged against uh, cost and schedule milestones only and not innovation project numbers or new innovations or you know some metric there, then they'll hear the words, but they won't believe you. And so none of the resources will get allocated. Um, and there are resources, this takes resources to run a challenge is not free. Um, and so one of the things we're trying to do that makes us a regular tool is we have to talk them out of some of their budget has to go into this. Um, and that there's always that tension between working on what's due this year and strategic investment. You know, how much do you carve off? How do you because otherwise you get five years down the road and suddenly you're obsolete, right? I mean, we know that, uh, Kodak, right? Um, but how do you carve that off smartly to where you're putting it into things that will really help you? That's the question. Um, and so that's fundamental to it. And if you don't have a good, a good story on strategic investment, then it's really hard to get in, open innovation going because it's change on top of that, right? And so it's, you gotta have the backing for it. Um, I think having good stories, uh, pilot projects are excellent ways to kind of get, get your foot in the door, uh, get people preaching it, um, and get people experience on how to, how to facilitate it. Because this stuff isn't, you know, think back to the first time you used some, some new ID, you know, in uh, development environment. It, it was hard, right? It's a change and, and you got to learn something new or, or some new, some new tool. Any new tool has this pain uh, process associated with it. So really, it's it's getting getting it to where there's a least amount of pain to adopt it and the the maximum benefit. What I ha what we've seen is a, a large number of projects. Once they do one challenge, uh, they actually come back. So we're we're starting to compile some numbers on that. But is that is that helpful? If I may, we were talking uh, be, before the presentation here. I really liked. You're kind of riffing on the changing nature of work and yeah. bringing together high-performing teams and how this. I, I just, yeah, I'd, lo I'd love for the Mozillians to kind of hear sure. you on that too. Yeah, so um, so I always like to start with online dating uh, for this because um, if ten or fifteen years ago somebody were to tell you, "Hey, uh, online dating is where it's at. It's where most people are going to meet their their uh, romantic relationships," uh, you probably would have been like, "No." Nothing that's very personal that would never happen. And yet now that is what we see, right? Uh, the bulk of dating, I'm not dating right now, but I, I'm pretty sure that uh, almost everyone who's dating that has at least some of that going on. Um, and I think the same is true with matching work to experts and people that can do the work. If you think about a commercial model, that's not a great model, right? You, you bring people in, you look at their resume, that has some stuff you might believe, some stuff you might not believe. You got to verify that you're bringing them in to go do work that's somewhat undefined, right? It's 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 a basic job, and in ma manufacturing that would be easy, right? But in in some of the more information economy, it's it's harder because that work changes. If you have a way to actually pull people together and match them, and that's what these communities are starting to do, is 
is these intermediaries like Topcoat or like Freelancer, they're actually matching up work to expertise. And they're doing that through various mechanisms like contests. Uh, but there's other mechanisms too. And if you think about it, the next step, logical step, is probably going to be the folks that figure out how to actually put high-performing teams together in the same fashion. If you've ever worked on a high-performing team, it's the best experience you've ever had in your life, right? And they produce at 10x what normal teams do. And so if you can use this matching magic to actually put high-performing teams together repeatedly um, by looking at really detailed information about what these people have done, uh, there's really a, an amplification of effectiveness that could happen because then suddenly crowds could start taking on really complex uh, multidisciplinary problems. Whereas now a lot of the crowds, you really, there are some teaming, but but it's ad, it's not nearly to the level uh, that I'm talking about here. So, so I, I see the futures really, you know, the gig economy and the, the freelance work is really on the rise. And so the tools that make those effective uh, resources, I think, are also on the rise. And uh, the folks that can figure out how to do that first are, are going are gonna to do well. OK. There was some conversation, again, about the community, about the folks that are participating. Sure. So there's two questions I'm going to combine. First is uh, you partnered with Harvard, mm -hmm. and what is Harvard doing in terms of incentivizing the, the folks in the community to participate? Um, what are they studying or monitoring about the success of the non-financial incentives, and what are the results? And then related to that around tracking and monitoring, um, do you have data on how you've been able to broaden the reach to diverse contributions through open innovation, and what have you found that may be difficult in this area? Yeah, so that was five questions, but um, <laughs> so. Nice counting. So, um, well, I, that's all I counted, right? Um, so on the Harvard stuff, I would really encourage you to, to maybe bring in Jin Paik and some of his team because, um, and, and Kareem Lakani, uh, just a, a brilliant guy. They've been doing a whole host of different challenges. They had a, a big data science bent, and so they did a lot on top coder and data science, and they were using largely cash uh, incentives. Um, but they, I know they did experiment with T-shirts and with swag and with uh, I think they even had some, you know, come to Harvard and get a workshop or th stuff like that. Um, but but they were looking at varying the incentives, and that's actually where they came up with this idea that hey, y you can over overprice a challenge and actually get worse results. Um, so I, I would I don't want to speak too much to their research because I think uh, that deserves a whole host of stuff. But they have been looking at. Uh, outreach participation how to how to bring people on how to incentivize them um and what steps are necessary um what was the set last piece uh, it was it was around creating more diverse contributions within the community yeah so <laughs> what's interesting on diversity is um and, and there's some really great literature on diversity and how important diversity is for innovation and getting great solutions um if you look at the communities, um, they're all very different, um, but they're, they kind of fall into two classes, in my opinion. One is the expert community, like a top coder, like a Kaggle, where it's all people that are data scientists or all software engineers, uh, or a Tongle, where they're all filmmakers. And then there's the other side, which are like Innocentive and Nine Sigma. And those are intentionally multidisciplined, very diverse uh, uh, communities because their focus is this innovative problem solving. Um, now, that said, I think you still get some of that in these other communities. Um, there's a certain amount of, uh, of diversity that you get in some dimensions that still helps you. But there are definitely some focused communities that that is their, that's the thing they bring to the table is that, you know, the, the potato chip thing where you had a musician solver, right? Um, that that's the thing they bring to it and in fact those communities tend to have uh, stories about these super solvers you know that nerdy friend you have that still remembers all the formulas from college and knows everything because they read every technical journal those people are amazing when it comes to, to solving hard technical problems and there are a few of them on those platforms that that just bring bring in solutions you should never even dreamed of okay one more call for any in-room questions I can't see the other offices. Otherwise, okay, we have one more in room and then we'll take one more online. 
I'm just curious if what you had uh, planned for the near future for, for your work at, at NASA. Um, what do we have planned? Um, so we're really working on our outreach. So our group is somewhat a broker group, if you think about it, right? Because on the one hand, we're trying to recruit our workforce uh, and our organization to try to actually use the tools. Um, and that's a nonstop roadshow, one-on-one -on -one with groups, helping them with workshops, trying to, to come up with uh, ways that they see their work in this context. Um, and that's really tough. So we're looking at, at some new facilitated methods. Uh, if you've seen them out, Google Ventures has Sprint, uh, which is a really interesting methodology. Uh, Adobe has their new uh, Redbox methodology, an open source methodology for, for really hitting innovation. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is you, when you get with technical teams, they can see the pitch, but unless you kind of walk through where it actually works for them, it doesn't come naturally to most folks. There's a handful of folks that will look at something and go, oh, yeah, I've got a challenge for you. Most of them go, that's fascinating. I have my next meeting, right? And it just, they just, because it takes some time to kind of take and apply uh, this stuff into it. So that's what we use workshops, and we're going to be doing a lot more of those um, and trying to get to that. Um, we're, we're always looking at more and more platforms. So in a couple of years, we'll recompete our, our noise contract, and hopefully we'll have another 15 or 20 uh, uh, companies come in on board and every time we do that we learn a lot uh, about new techniques uh, and, and the ways they do things uh, the, the micro purchase challenge I actually don't know what the limit to that is yet especially when you have a name brand like NASA people will they want to do stuff and um, they want to do hard stuff and the money's not that big of a deal for them um, and and I'm torn on that right because on the one hand, it's this great public engagement tool to let us, but we don't have tons of funds to just go do, you know, hey, we want ideas on Mars pioneering. So, you know, there's a balancing act there because a lot of, of the freelance community looks at that and goes, hey, you're, you're just taking advantage of us. It's like, well, if I have a choice of doing no challenges or spending my $3,500 on a credit card and doing a bunch of little challenges that engage thousands of people, um, you know, for those thousands of people, they really like that. And, and I, but I do recognize there's a, a little bit of a freelance change going on where uh, people are really sensitive to not getting their due, not getting uh, the, the, the money and the benefits out of these. And that's, that's a real struggle, and I think that's going to start to rectify itself over time as as wages come up and as people figure out how to give benefits to those folks and and a whole you know a whole bunch of stabilizing elements. But we're in a time of change right now, and uh, so a lot of that's painful. I kind of took a sidetrack on that. But. Thank you, Steve. That that it was certainly very salient, uh, also to the conversation in the Slack channel. So it was not a sidetrack. Um, with that, we'll let the folks in the room circle around the NASA stickers that yeah. you brought. Yeah. So thank you very, very much. Absolutely. And if you're online, get them to mail you something. No. Yeah. We'll figure yeah, out thanks. exportation.